Please stand for the reading of God's word. 12. For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, he will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Lord God, our Father in heaven, as we come to the time of the preaching of your word, we ask, Father, that you give us rest and you give us peace. And we turn towards you, knowing that you are there. Let us listen to your voice speaking, Lord, your voice that gives us wisdom, your voice that leads us to you, Lord. Let us look to you for wisdom and for guidance and for love. For my words, let my words be the words of a fool. Let my words disappear into the air. Let them be broken, let them be clumsy, let them be nothing, Lord, except that they give glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been going through a sermon series, the material that we're using in the Gospel Project, the class uh, Sunday School material, and we started with the New Testament, and we've been going through the book of Genesis, and particularly we've been going through this early part of the book of Genesis, the uh, first 11 chapters, which are quite different, which give us a very much a basis, a background to understand many things about God, about ourselves, about sin, about the way that the world is. Genesis chapters uh, 1 to 2 was talking about creation, so we know that God was the creator of all things. Then it talked about the fall in uh, chapter 3, about that we ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and because of that we became separated from God because of sin coming into the world. We learn about the flood, about God choosing a family to preserve this family where the entire world had torn towards evil. But through one family, he kept the human race going, through, kept them alive. And finally, that the human race descended from that one family, disobeyed his command to fill the entire world, and instead chose to seek after God in their own way by working together, by building this tower. And God confused their languages and scattered them over the earth. And when we looked at these chapters, at these first 11 chapters, we started to see a pattern about our relationship with God. And we started to see it with the fall. We talked about that there was the eating of the forbidden fruit, which was sin. They were driven out of Eden, which was judgment, but still God provided them, from, which was mercy. There was the flood, and once again, the same pattern. The people were continually evil. They sinned. There was the flood, which was judgment, and there was God saving this one family, these eight people, His act of mercy. At the Tower of Babel, the same again we see this. Disobedience of God, which was sin. People being scattered, which was judgment. And a new beginning, a new start. As they move on through the rest of the Bible, moving towards the, great, the greatest thing that God has ever given us, that He gave us His Son. A new beginning, which was His mercy. When we look at this, we can get a false understanding about God. What we see here is correct, but we have to be careful that we don't limit ourselves to this. If some of you come from a Buddhist background, you know that they see the world as a very, as a universe, as a very mechanical place. You do good things, you get good things. You do bad things, you get bad things. And that's the way they see it. They see it in terms of karma. And it's very much mechanical. It could be a computer, it could be a machine. And it's very easy to fall, us in, fall into this trap to say, bad things, you must have, uh, if you do bad things, you must be punished. And if you go through difficulty, it must be because you're a bad person. You've done something wrong. 
I used to believe this when I was a Christian, when I was first a Christian. I believed this very strongly. I believed in the bus of the God, of the God of the bus schedules, is what I used to call them. I lived in an apartment nearby, my, uh, nearby a bus stop, and I had to go to work every morning, and I'd come out, and I'd go to the bus stop. Sometimes I'd get there, and I was there for one minute, and the bus would come. And I'd say, ah, God is happy with me today. And sometimes I'd get there, and the bus had just left. And I'd say, I must have done something wrong. <laughs> God is punishing me. <laughs> because then I've got to wait another 20 minutes for the next bus to come along. And it's easy to fall into this trap of seeing things in terms of something has gone wrong, we've done something bad. And it's a very confusing thing, because we live in this world and bad things happen. And we're confronted with this all the time. Why do these things happen? Why do we go through suffering? Why do we go through sickness? Particularly if you're Christian, if you believe in God and you love God and you pray to God and you go to classes and you read the Bible, why do you get sick? Why does somebody you love die? And these are terrible questions and these are so difficult. And I'm not trying to make light of them. Because the reality is we all go through them. Bad things happen. Sickness and death happens. Every one of us will go through these things and experience this. Accident and pain will happen. Sometimes we don't understand. They say when I was studying about, uh, when I was studying to be a pastor, they said one of the most difficult jobs is a hospital chaplain. Because he has to visit people and sometimes the accidents and the sickness seem to be to people who don't deserve it. Young children with cancer, burn victims. How do we understand this? Did they sin? Did they sin in a past lifetime? War, natural disaster, these things happen. Some things we can understand. We've talked about sin coming into this world. This world is a sinful place. We live in a fallen world, and because of that, it affects us. Even if we try so hard to do the right thing, the fact that other people, they sin, and they would live in this sinful world. When I was thinking about this sermon, I realized that the world is a sinful place, and sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we can't see how much sin is in this world, how much it affects us. We don't see it. We see the good things. I mean, look at these people. Nice holiday place, comfortable, relaxing. Wouldn't you like to be with them? Isn't this great? I mean, we all like holidays. They're happy together, singing songs. I love this woman, the one on the... The woman who's over there, she's got this really strange look on her face. She's happy. She's so happy. Who are these people? They're the people that did this. This world has fallen and it affects us all. And that's sometimes why bad things happen. Sometimes it's our own failings, what we call the flesh. Paul reminds us so often, strive to be holy, strive for what God wants you to be. You can't be perfect by yourself. Don't expect to be. Don't expect to be sinless. But try. What does God want you to be? The Bible tells us. Paul writes in it, Colossians 3.12, so as to those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Put it on. That's you. Try. Try to be compassionate. Try to be kind. Try to have humility. Try to have gentleness. Try to have patience. You won't be perfect, but try. Because the reality is our flesh is weak. We need to pray to God to help us through this, with this. We're not going to be perfect in this world, but try. Because our natural flesh, the way that we are, is what Paul described a few verses earlier in Colossians 3.5. They are considered the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. 
which amounts to idolatry. All of us have these. All of us have greed. All of us have evil desires. I know you're good people. I know you're nice people. But if you look into your heart, you know there's that jealousy. There's that unforgiveness. There's so many things that are in our heart. We don't want them, and yet they're there because that's what we are. And this sometimes is why things happen. We do it to ourselves. Or it could be the devil. We're warned that there is an enemy. Peter warns us. He says, be of sober, be sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. To devour. Peter warns us this. Paul warns us, then do not give the devil an opportunity. But when we look at this and we look at this question about sin and judgment, about why things happen, we come back to a question. What about God? Where is God in this? Is he just a machine? Is he like an ATM machine? You put in the right code and you get money? Is that how it works? You do the right things, you get good things. You do the wrong things, you get bad things. Is it just like a machine? Is that what you view? Is that what we should view God as being? How are we to understand God in view of the reality that there is such terrible suffering in this world? My favorite book of the Bible is Job. I love that book. Anybody who goes through difficulty in this world, I think you will come to love that book. If if your favorite book is another one, okay, that's fine. But when you go through difficulty, so much you can read Job, and then you start to understand that it's not simple, mechanical, do bad, get bad, do good, get good. Because we read what happens here. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. So we know here he was a godly man. We read also he had seven sons and seven daughters were born to him. He was a faithful family man. Why do I say faithful? Because what he said about himself in verse 30, uh, chapter 31, verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then can I gaze on a virgin? He has made a covenant with his eyes not to look at a woman lustfully, to remain faithful to his wife, to remain with his family, to stay with them. So we know a godly man, a faithful family man, and we read about him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 700 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men in the east. So he was a rich man. That'd be great. Wouldn't you like to be that? A a godly person, a family person, a faithful person, a rich person. Wouldn't you love that? And yet we read what happened to him. Job chapter 1 verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That's scary because it's not the devil, it's God saying, look at him. This man, think about him. Satan probably didn't even notice him until God said, think about this man. He is this upright, he is this blameless, he is this fear man who fears God and turns away from evil. And God, Satan answers. And he says, have you not made a hedge around him in his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But foot forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. A challenge between them. Some people like to say it was Satan's fault, but it was God that started it. God drew Satan's attention to Job and said, "This this is my servant, this good man. Think about him. And Satan said, well, he's good because he gets good things. That's that equation that we have, that mechanical version of God. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. He does good, so he gets good. And he says, what happens if he doesn't? What happens if this godly man, this good man, this faithful man, if you take it all away? And that's what happened. Then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. 
a conversation between God and between Satan. It tells us something about Satan, that Satan can demand of God or can ask of God. He did it with Peter, where Jesus said, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat before Peter was to deny Jesus. And what happened to Job after this conversation? Job 1, 14, 15, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabaeans, that's another group of people, attacked and took them. So his donkeys and his oxen were all stolen. They were all taken away. And while this servant was speaking, another one came. <laughs> that's very quickly. One happened and the next one and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants consumed them and I alone have escaped to tell you. So now his donkeys are gone, his oxen is gone, his sheep is gone. That means his wealth is gone. He's no longer a rich man. One servant uh, says this, another servant said this, suddenly everything is gone and he's no longer wealthy. And then the next blow, while he was speaking, another also came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they died. Job lost many things within a few minutes, according to this. He lost his wealth, and he lost his children. His response to this was still to stay faithful to God. Satan has said, he will curse you to his face, to your face. Instead, Job's response was to say this, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He's a much stronger faith than I have. I wondered what I would do if I lost everything, if suddenly everybody in my family died, if suddenly everything was taken away from me, what would I do? And I don't know. But in then, more came because then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord because Satan had gone back and said, possessions, that doesn't really matter. Health, that's what matters. And he got permission to damage his health. And then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote, means hit, Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a pot's herd, that's a piece of clay from a broken piece of pottery, to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. So his wealth, his children, and his health. And he becomes like this. Other people see this and they respond to it. His wife, and his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die, because he's lost everything. And then his friends come. Now when Job, uh, when Job's three friends heard of all his adversity that had come upon him, they came each one with their own, from his own place, and they made an appointment together to come and sympathize with him and comfort him. They came, and we read in the Bible that they were so saddened by what they saw that for three days they couldn't speak. They just sat with him. And this is often the right thing to do. Often there are no words. Often it's very difficult to say anything. But to just be there was the right thing. But these were people who lived at that time. They were drawn back into the wisdom of that time. And the wisdom of that time says, do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. And so they were confused that such terrible things had happened to this man. And they said, you, you must have done something. We can't see it, but you did it. You must have. Otherwise, it would never happen like this. Nothing like this would ever happen. And eventually they wound up challenging him and, and saying, is not your wickedness great and your iniquities without end? Look at your life. It must be your fault. You must deserve this. If you ever visit somebody in a hospital with cancer, never say this. Never say it's your fault. <laughs> you lived a corrupt life. <laughs> you deserve it. Never say these words even if they're true, and we can't, we can't judge, we don't know. Only God can know. And this is what the friends did, because they were stuck in this view. They were caught in this view. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. And how many of us think the same way? 
Do good so we get good things. Do good so the bus will be there on time. Do bad and you miss the bus and you've got to wait until the next one. But God, in the end of the book of Job, came and he answered. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and to the friends he said this. It came about after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, he is the oldest of the three friends, my wrath is kindled against you. I am angry with you against you and your friends, because you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. He says clearly this view of do good, get good, go bad, get bad. There is judgment, it is true, but if you limit God to being a machine of just answering, of being like an ADM machine where you push in the right code and get what you want, your view is wrong. It's more than that. You can't just look at this and say, he did, he's receiving bad, he must have been a bad person. And if this young child, it must have been in a previous life, which is what the Buddhists often say. But to Job, how do you explain it? How do you explain to this man who's lost everything, who's lost his children, who's lost his wealth, who's lost his health, he's lost everything. And you look to the end of Job and you say, give us the answer. Tell us why. Explain to us why you did it to this man. Why you do it to us. Tell us why. Explain to us. And that's when we come to something so special in the book of Job, is he doesn't answer. He simply asks a question himself and says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And what we're challenged with is we don't understand. We don't understand in this world what happens. We shared in this Lord's Supper today, talking about Jesus dying for us and forgiveness of sins. I would never have sent my son to die. I would never have done that. But there are things beyond our understanding. Things that meant Jesus had to come into this world to die for us. And there are things that happen in our lives that we don't understand. When I was going through a lot of trouble in the past, I went through a period of a couple of years. Where things were very difficult. And I looked at the Bible for an answer. And God kept drawing me back to one chapter in the Bible. I love that chapter. It's right in the middle of the book of Job. And you read it and it seems so out of place. It seems, what is this chapter doing here? And it's the verse chapter 28 on wisdom. And it asks the question, but where can wisdom be found? Where is this place of understanding? In this world, we think we're smart. We think we understand so many things. And we are smart, and we do understand a lot of things. There are some things that we can't understand from reading books in a library. There are some things we can't understand from sitting in a classroom. There's some things you can't understand even from listening to me. You have to go through it. You have to experience it. And then God takes you to a new level of understanding, a new level of relationship with him. Job 28, 28. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And depart from evil, that is understanding. As we go through life, we're on a journey. We see it throughout the Bible, journeys. Abraham making a journey from Uz up to Haram and down to the Promised Land. Joseph making a journey of into slavery in Egypt and then making... And then finally, they're making a journey back under Moses to come back to the promised land. There's a journey sometimes in geography, in places, like many of you come from other countries, from Nigeria, from Ethiopia, from the United States, from so many different places, and you come here. But there's also a journey in your heart, a journey in your soul, a journey in your understanding of God.
a journey in your relationship with him. The best way I've found to describe it in the terms of moving from one room to another room, a lower room and a higher room. Because naturally, we live in the lower room. When you live in the lower room, what is most important to you is yourself. What you have, your happiness, your comfort, what it's if you, what you focus on. And this, if you're honest with yourself, is always what you go back to, me. What about me? What about my comfort? What about my happiness? And so, because everything is focused on me, I want to be in control of everything so that I will always be comfortable and nothing bad will ever happen to me. So that I will always be avoiding danger, so that I will be always be avoiding difficulty, always avoiding sickness. And we try to control everything around us. And if you're honest, you probably have to admit, this is me. Stay away from those people, they will hurt me. Stay away from that situation. I won't be comfortable there. And then when things do go wrong, we try to define it. Why? Why did it go wrong? What happened? Was it that person? That person is to blame? Was it that situation? Was it that situation is to blame? We try to define it. And then in the end, we wind up giving ourselves rules and saying, do this and everything will be good. Do this and it'll go wrong. And we learn all these rules about how to live in life. And we say it, it all becomes doing Christian things rather than being Christian, being sons and daughters of God. And we start to focus on what do we do so that we can avoid the difficulty. And we try to be in control of our life. And if you're honest with yourself, that's naturally the way we think. But when you go through difficulty, you realize that answer is not enough. There is something beyond that. And that's what I've talked about as being the upper room. And through that difficulty, through that suffering, through that pain, through what Job went through, you go into the upper room, and then that focus on self becomes a focus on God, where you simply want to worship and say, you are sovereign. I don't understand, but I know you love me, and I will give my life to you. Instead of controlling everything around us, trying to control other people, trying to control our environment, trying to control our situation, trying to control everything, what we say, so we say the right things, so we'll get good things, do the right things, so we get good things. Instead of trying to be in control, we trust. God is there. He hasn't left us. He never will leave us. Trust Him. The only way you can learn how to trust him is to have something to trust him with. And that only really comes through difficulty. The only way to learn to forgive somebody is to be hurt, to have something to forgive. The only way to really learn trust and faith in God is to go through a time where that trust is, is tested. When you start to define everything around the world, instead you give up and say, I don't understand. And that's when you really start to grow, when you simply trust in God and let Him grow, lead you on the path that He has for you. I came to this church, I never expected to be a pastor. If you asked me at any time in my life, did I think, did I want to be a pastor, I would say, are you crazy? And yet here I am. Because I said a long time ago, Show me a real, and I'll give my life to you. And this is where he's led me to. And instead of trying to perform and giving yourself rules about how to have good things and avoid bad things, how to be on time for that bus, instead you simply obey. Obey what God tells you, obey the Word of God, and know that He is there. We go through journeys, and on the journey, you will go through times of darkness. You will go through pain. You will go through suffering. I promise it to you. I don't promise if you become Christian, everything will be okay. 
It won't. But God will use these things to move you from a life where you're focused only on yourself, where you want to control everything, where you want to define everything, where you just say, what can I do to get what I want, to saying, you are Lord and you love me and you gave your son for me and I will give my life for you. Will you trust, will you grow, and will you obey? There will be times of darkness, but look up. Look up and see the stars. Look up and see God's creation. Look up and see God's love for you. I know many of you have gone through difficulty. I know about it from the prayer meeting on Wednesday when we pray for people. I know about it because you're human. And I know you will go through this, but I know God loves you. I feel it in this church, His love for you. That you are sons and daughters of God, and He will never leave you. When you go through these things, remember, He is moving you on a journey from the lower room to the upper room. And the surprising thing is when you get there, you will look to Him and you'll say, thank you. Thank you for what I went through. I don't want to do it again, but thank you so much. Let's take a moment and let's pray. Pray about the things that we have gone through. Recognize the things in the past that we have gone through, the path that God has led us on. If you need wisdom, ask for wisdom. If you need God to show you his love, ask him. And if you've been on this path through the darkness, thank him for the light. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we confess to you, Lord, that so many things as we live in this world are difficult. We know that we live in a sinful world, and sometimes it's because of that. We know that we are weak and we sin, and sometimes it's because of that. We know that we have an enemy, and sometimes it's because of that. But sometimes, Father, you have a path for us that is so hard for us to understand. But let us follow. Let us move away from focusing on ourselves to focusing on you, that you'll love us, that you will never leave us, that you will never abandon us, that you gave your son to suffer the worst possible torture and to die for us because you love for us. Let us follow as you lead. Let us grow as your sons and daughters. Let us simply belong to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.